October 15, 1970 was one of the most important dates in mob history, but at the time, most mobsters and their defense attorneys didn't know it. This was the date RICO, or the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, was signed into law by then-President Richard Nixon. Carl Syphakis writes that prior to RICO, a top mafioso or two was forced to do a short prison stretch, terms, as they said, they could do sitting on their heads. To say it another way, law enforcement might bust a low-level guy or two every once in a while, but they were rarely able to get a boss. After the restructuring of the American Mafia in the 1930s, a simple tenet of criminal law had been exploited. Guy Lawson and former NYPD detective William Oldham explain, a man could only be charged, tried, and convicted for crimes he personally committed. Historically, common law held a defendant responsible only for his own actions. If a mob boss didn't pull the trigger, if he could plausibly deny instructing a hitman to murder a victim, it was hard to make a case against him. There were conspiracy laws, but they were extremely difficult to prove because of the strict rules of evidence and hearsay. To put it simply, prior to RICO, the law had a lot of bark but very little bite. Enter G. Robert Blakey, who worked with Senator John McClellan. Under the latter's leadership, the government conducted the Select Committee on Improper Activities in Labor and Management. The committee got the nickname the Valachi Hearings due to the top witness for the feds, Joseph Valachi, the first major mobster of one of the five families to flip. This committee investigated organized crime activities across America and centered on Teamster head and mob associate Jimmy Hoffa and other leading mobsters of the era such as Sam Giancana of Chicago. Blakey drafted the RICO Act, Title IX of the Organized Crime Control Act of 1970 as a result of the committee's failure to secure anything major as a result of the hearings. RICO was considered landmark legislation in American criminal law and, according to prosecutors, finally gave the dog teeth. The law got its nickname from the main character, Rico Bandello, in the 1930 Hollywood film Little Caesar. RICO allowed prosecutors to connect the different elements of a criminal enterprise together to tell the story behind the scenes. RICO wasn't about convicting a single defendant. The purpose was to cripple the whole organization. Numerous charges could be brought against multiple defendants. Hearsay evidence became admissible. Associative evidence was allowed, the demonstration of guilt by association. To put it more succinctly, if a defendant profited off the crimes of an organization, even if he was not directly involved with the crime himself, he could be charged as a co-conspirator. Blakey tried to demonstrate how he had created an intricate system of rewards and punishments to entice wise guys to turn into snitches. Prosecutions would then go all the way up the chain of command. The law sat on the shelf for nearly a decade, though Blakey tirelessly held seminars for law enforcement and prosecutors, introducing them to the finer points of the legislation. Finally, in 1982, federal prosecutors used the law against Cleveland crime boss James Licavoli. Licavoli, along with 15 others, were arrested, tried, and convicted under RICO. Licavoli got 17 years in federal prison. He died in his jail cell a few years later in 1985. Federal prosecutors were elated to say the least. RICO had done its job. Now it was time to turn to bigger fish the heads of the five families who controlled New York's underworld. Carl Syphakis continues, The top echelon gangsters of these groups were astonished and outraged that they could be convicted under RICO by their very membership in the Mafia or the National Commission. But RICO did other things than just help with convictions. It also allowed for asset seizure, a first in American jurisprudence. Again citing William Oldham, Assets were seized, turning mobster millionaires into penitent paupers. Sentences were meted out in decades, not years. The prospect of life in jail was not enough 
under the guidelines. Life sentences could be multiplied for every murder count. Lives mounted on lives unto eternity. Just the threat of a long prison term calls many gangsters to flip, becoming witnesses for the government. If a mobster was facing multiple life sentences, he could cooperate and have a chance for freedom and a new life. Rico's blend of long prison sentences and incentives for cooperators, coupled with the witness protection program, made the logic of becoming a rat simple. Rat or rot became the motto of federal prosecutors. In short, omerta, the gangster code of silence, was for many flushed down the toilet. Using evidence obtained by the FBI, 11 organized crime figures, including the heads of New York's so-called fine families, were indicted by United States Attorney Rudolph Giuliani under RICO on charges including extortion, labor racketeering, and murder for hire. The case struck a devastating blow against the commission, the mob's ruling board of directors. The commission case, as the prosecution was known, was the beginning of the end for the modern mafia. Time magazine called it the case of cases, noting that it was the most significant assault on the infrastructure of organized crime since the high command of the Chicago Mafia was swept away in 1934, and quoted Giuliani's stated intention, our approach is to wipe out the five families. The hardest hit family by Rico had to be the Lucases. Their entire leadership, including the boss Tony Ducks Corallo, who got the nickname Ducks because of his ability before Rico to duck indictments and convictions, found himself doing a hundred years. At this time, the Lucases also saw their underboss, Salvatore Tom Mix Santoro and Consigliere Christopher Christy Tick Fineri also fall to Rico. The boss of the Gambino family, Paul Castellano, was indicted also. But before the trial, he fell before the guns of an ambitious capo named John Gotti, who took over the Gambino Borgata. And though given the name by the press as the Teflon Don for beating the feds in previous cases, he too felt the power and weight of Rico a few years later. The most shocking thing to come out of Gotti's trial was the government got his underboss, Sammy the Bull Gravano, to flip. Gravano was the highest ranking mafia figure to turn government witness up until that point. Citing again William Oldham, the biggest change brought about by the law was the sudden deluge of snitches. Supposed tough guys, sworn to an oath of omerta, now tried to make deals with the federal government in mass. Time in federal prison would be hard and lonely, year after year, staring at a wall in Marion, Illinois, or in a supermax cell dug into the side of a mountain in Florence, Colorado. Betrayal begat betrayal as layers of secrecy enveloping the Mafia were peeled away. As a result of RICO, the modern-day Mafia is in shambles. The best and the brightest the Italian community has to offer no longer believes the tales of honor and respect in the secret society. Now they go to college and work to become doctors, lawyers, or teachers. What is left as far as potential new recruitment isn't even a shadow of the glory days of Charlie Luciano, Frank Costello, and Joey Adonis. As one reporter noted, those who go into the life today are nothing but the dregs. So will the Mafia make a comeback? It is possible, but according to numerous sources, it is highly doubtful.